In this lesson, we're going to look at radioactivity. The first aim is explain what a radioisotope is, then compare the properties of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, and finally explain how these radiations ionize atoms. Hollywood films can certainly paint quite a rosy picture of radiation. Many superhero blockbuster movies basically start with some sort of radiation accident which results in the protagonist of the film having superpowers like the Hulk or Spider-Man. But I think there's one comic character which maybe deals with radiation in a slightly different way. In 1945, the Americans dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima in Japan, which had devastating consequences. It has been said that the heat from the blast caused nearby beaches to basically melt and form glass, shards of glass, on the beach where the sand had fused together. Another bomb was dropped on Nagasaki in Japan. The two explosions resulted in the death of 129,000 people. You can imagine an event of this catastrophic scale would be pretty hard for a country to forget. And its story lives on in quite an unusual form. I'm sure you've heard of Godzilla a huge towering reptilian beast born of radiation, destroying, tearing apart a city. You can see how Godzilla is a metaphor for an atomic bomb. It charges through a city and it doesn't discriminate, it destroys everything in its path. This comic embodies the power of the nucleus, and it's the nucleus we have to look at to understand radiation. Now we've already looked at radiation in the form of electromagnetic radiation, those are the different frequencies of radiation emitted by our sun. But in this tutorial, we're talking about radioactive particles. This is matter ejected from a nucleus, and it's not quite the same, so don't get confused between the two. Before we can understand radiation, we must have a recap on isotopes. Let's try and understand the term isotope. The word isotope literally translates to same, place. Iso means same, tope means place, from the Greek word for place. So we're literally talking about elements that occupy the same place in the periodic table. But that probably doesn't help you very much. So let's think about it in terms of cards. So in a deck of cards, you have four suits, or if you like, four families. You have hearts, clubs, spades, and diamonds. Now, each family or each suit contains a number of values that belong to that suit. For example, you have ace of hearts, king of hearts, two of hearts, and so on and so on. But they still belong to the same set. You can think of the 118 elements in the periodic table as different suits of cards, where each suit or each element contains a number of different types of atoms or different values of atoms. For example, there isn't just one type of carbon atom, there are many. You get carbon 10, carbon 12, carbon 14. So what does this mean exactly? Well, they are carbon atoms because they all have an atomic number of six. In other words, that means they all have six protons in their nucleus. You can count them here. That's what the atomic number tells you. The atomic number defines the type of element the atom belongs to. So if you have an atomic number of six, you will always be a member of the carbon atom family. It also tells you that they'll have six electrons in the shells, which always balance the number of protons. So the overall charge of an atom is always zero because the positives cancel out the negatives or balance with the negatives. But you don't really need to think about electrons when trying to describe or define isotopes. You just need to think about protons and neutrons. Now, it's the neutrons you'll see that are different. You only have four neutrons here. You only have six here, and you have eight here. Now, the neutrons don't affect what the element is. So you could have 15 or 2,000 neutrons here, but as long as you have six protons, it will still be a carbon atom. So chemically, these are all very similar atoms. They all behave in the same way, but you can see their mass is increasing. So if you count the number of particles here, they'll equal 10. Whereas here, 6 neutrons and 6 protons, 12. Here, 6 protons and 8 neutrons adds up to 14. That's why this is called carbon-14, this is called carbon-12, and this is called carbon-10. So the textbook definition of an isotope would be, isotopes are atoms, in brackets, of a particular element, with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So you can see I've got two isotopes of carbon here. I've got carbon-12 and carbon-14. Like all isotopes, they have the same atomic number, the same number of protons, that's six. That's why they're carbon atoms. This also has six. But the number of neutrons is different. This one has six. So six neutrons plus six protons gives this isotope a mass of 12. That's why it's called carbon-12. Whereas this one has eight neutrons. So eight neutrons plus six protons gives a mass of 14, carbon-14. 
Now, some isotopes are stable. They will stay as they are, like carbon-12 is a stable isotope. But most isotopes are unstable. We call these radioisotopes. In other words, they're not happy with the balance of neutrons and protons in their nucleus, and to gain stability, they'll have to shed some of this matter, eject it from the nucleus. So these radioisotopes eject matter from their nucleus to gain stability. What they eject and when they eject it is a completely random process. But the radiation we're going to be talking about in this tutorial is the matter they eject from their nucleus. And there are three things atoms can eject, or rather radioisotopes can eject. So if you understand that radioisotopes are basically atoms which have an unstable nucleus, then you can explain what a radioisotope is. So, I said there are three particles that a nucleus can eject, and we're going to look at these now. So, we're going to compare the properties of the different radioactive particles. This table summarizes what you need to know very concisely, um, but you will need to apply what you learn in this table to some unfamiliar examples in exams. So, learn this well. So, there are three types of particles, an alpha particle, a beta particle, and truthfully, the third one is not a particle. We call it gamma radiation, and it's the same as the gamma radiation we get from our sun. It's an electromagnetic wave. So, alpha and beta are particles, but gamma radiation is an electromagnetic wave. So, what is alpha radiation? Well, alpha radiation is a helium nucleus. If you looked at the nucleus of a helium atom, you would see two protons and two neutrons. So a helium nucleus is what a radioisotope will eject if it's losing an alpha particle. So let's say this is our nucleus, it's a radioisotope, it's unstable and it needs to gain stability and it'll do it by ejecting an alpha particle. And there you can see it's a helium nucleus. Now here's a point which can get overlooked quite easily. When an atom decays through losing an alpha particle, it will actually change the structure of the atom. Remember, it's losing four particles here, two protons and two neutrons. That means the mass and the atomic number of the atom changes. When a radioisotope loses an alpha particle, its atomic number goes down by two. That's because it's losing two protons, and it's the number of protons that define the atomic number. However, it's losing four particles with an equal mass. They all have a mass of one. So the atomic mass goes down by 4 when a radioisotope ejects an alpha particle. Now, alpha particles are very, very big, and therefore they don't pose as much damage. Well, not from outside the body. In fact, due to its size, an alpha particle can be stopped by paper. And similarly, it can be stopped by skin. So as alpha particles cannot enter our body, they're not very dangerous to us unless we swallow it. You may remember the news a few years ago, a Russian federal officer, Alexander Litvinenko, was poisoned by someone putting an alpha source in their drink. This resulted in their death. You see, once an alpha particle is in your body and it's surrounded by soft tissue, not the dead layer of skin cells that basically surround your skin, then it can cause a lot of havoc in the body, leading to cancer and radiation poisoning. So due to its size, alpha radiation is actually the most ionizing. It's the most dangerous inside our body, but it's a tough job getting it inside our body. So least penetrating, stopped by paper and skin, but most ionizing. Next, we have beta radiation. Beta radiation is basically a high-speed electron. When a radioisotope decays through beta radiation, a neutron breaks down or degrades into a proton and an electron. The proton stays in the nucleus, but the electron is fired out at high speed. Now, because that neutron has broken down into a proton, the atomic number increases by one when something decays because it now has one more proton than it used to. But as it's only lost an electron, a virtually massless particle, the overall mass of the isotope doesn't change. The only thing happens is the atomic number increases by one due to this extra proton. Now, electrons are much, much smaller than alpha particles, so they can travel through paper, no problem, but aluminium will stop a beta particle. In terms of our body, well, beta particles can basically go through skin, but they stop about 10 centimeters into our body because there's too much resistance for them to get through and they get absorbed. So beta particles have a medium penetrating ability, they are stopped by aluminium, and they have a medium sort of level of ionizing ability too. They're not the most ionizing, but they're not the least either. 
Now, gamma radiation is basically an electromagnetic wave. When a radioisotope decays by either alpha or beta radiation, there's sometimes some residual energy left over which is shed in the form of an electromagnetic wave in the gamma part of the spectrum. In other words, it emits gamma radiation. Gamma, again, is a massless electromagnetic wave, and therefore it doesn't affect the atomic number or the atomic mass. Gamma, being an electromagnetic wave, is so much smaller than a beta particle, or obviously an alpha particle, that it can get through paper no problem, it can get through aluminium no problem. In fact, you need thick lead or concrete to stop or absorb gamma radiation. Because it's so small, it's not that dangerous to us, it just basically whizzes through our body. That's not to say it can't cause us damage, but being very small, there's a good chance it won't hit anything. So actually, gamma radiation is the least ionising. So remember that alpha particles are blocked by paper, beta by aluminium, and gamma by lead or thick concrete. You may have seen this in your science lessons that you can use a Geiger-Muller tube or a Geiger counter to detect radiation events. To be specific, what it actually detects is when one of these particles ionizes an atom near the counter, and then you get a click by the counter. The more clicks it detects, the more ionizing events it's detecting. So imagine we've got these three levels of shielding, paper, aluminium and lead. And if we're standing basically between no barrier between the alpha source, beta source and gamma and our GM tube, you're going to hear a lot of clicking over here. However, if you stand behind paper, we know alpha particles can't get through paper, so we'll get less clicking. If we move behind the aluminium, the beta particles can't get through. So again, there's less clicking. And if we stand behind the lead, well, none of the radiations get through, so you should get far less clicking. You will still get some clicking due to background radiation, but we'll look at that in another tutorial. It's very important you remember the penetrating ability of these ionizing radiations, because you will have to apply this in quite unfamiliar contexts in your exams. This table is well worth jotting down and remembering. So that's how you compare the properties of alpha, beta and gamma radiation. So finally, let's look at what we mean by ionizing radiation. How do radiations ionize atoms? Well, if you remember from chemistry, an ion is a charged atom. Why do atoms become charged? Well, because they either gain or lose electrons from their outer shell, leaving you with an imbalance of negative charge on the outside and positive charge from the protons in the nucleus. You see, normally there's a balance between the two, so the overall charge of an atom is zero. But if you can knock electrons off, there'll be a positive charge left over. So alpha particles have a 2 plus charge, and that's because they have two protons. So what happens is, as they basically pass nearby atoms, the 2 plus charge attracts two electrons to it. So an alpha particle will strip two electrons away from the outer shell of an atom, leaving the atom with a 2 plus charge. Now this atom is charged, it can cause problems. For example, if this was an atom in a DNA molecule, having a charged atom might cause it to clump together or unwind and cause all sorts of problems when expressing your genes. It could lead to cancer. So alpha particles have a 2 plus charge, so will attract two electrons, attract two electrons from the outer shell of atoms. A beta particle, or a high-speed electron, has a negative charge because electrons also have negative charge when an electron basically comes near a beta particle a beta particle will repel the electron away from its shell. So a beta particle has a 1 minus charge, so it will repel an electron away from the outer shell of an atom. Once again, because we have less electrons now, we have an overall positive charge. So we created an ion, but this ion only has a 1 plus charge, not a 2 plus charge, because beta particles only knock off one electron. So assume the alpha hadn't done that. We've only lost one electron. Finally, what gamma radiation does is if it strikes an electron, it basically causes it to energize and then it breaks free from the atom. So gamma radiation will be absorbed by an electron which becomes energized and breaks free of its shell. So all three types of radiation will strip electrons away from the outer shell of atoms, alpha particles attract two electrons, beta particles repel one electron, and gamma will energize an electron and cause it to break free. And that's how you explain how these radiations ionize atoms.